Thank you very much for coming out. I know that uh, we had a bit of a late start and the room is nice and warm, so uh, no one, hopefully, please don't fall asleep. Uh, we'll keep it trying to be active and engaged. Uh, so thank you. Then uh, a little bit of background. So I had been working on the, with uh, the HPC guys and the heterogeneous systems, and we had a lot of wonderful speakers. But over a period of time, what I started to notice was that core technologies are really what Silicon Valley is about. And the ability to leverage these core technologies and technology advances in hardware, software, systems, material science, and other areas. And these are the fundamental building blocks of the leading technology companies in the Bay Area. So what I thought was, let's get something going. And John happened to be en route from here to Japan. And I said, why don't you stay an extra day and let's pull something together. So John has been doing some amazing work at the crossroads of uh, performance programming, heterogeneous computing, and basically programmer productivity. So I thought this would be a great chance to talk about this because one of the big things we have is we have so much compute resource and how do we unleash the power of that? So with that, I thought John would be a great candidate. He is, he is a PhD out of UIUC. He uh, did his PhD under Wenmei. He's one of the world's authorities in compiler technologies. He's also CTO of MultiCoreware. As you can gather, this event is, initially, is being sponsored by MultiCore. <coughs> the next event will not be sponsored by MultiCore's primary. It'll be probably in other areas, and it'll not be a free event. It'll be a, probably a charge for event. So this is our inaugural. Uh, John is also a professor at Colgate University. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to him. And I would like you to please, if you want to stay in touch, there's uh, somewhere there's a sign-up sheet going around. Uh, that's if you want to stay in touch with uh, what John's doing and MultiCoreWare. If you don't, that's OK. No hard feelings. Uh, but please do stay in touch with us by either signing up a tie, uh, because the, we're going to be driving the next series of events through here. And uh, please, thank you again uh, for your time. And I'll hand over to John. Thank you, Manu. So uh, again, as Manu said, my name is John Stratton. And I came from Midwest uh, University of Illinois, where I started off with a project at kind of the dawn of GPU computing the way we see it today, where when May got involved as the CTO of this company, MultiCoreWare, I was working on my PhD, and I tried to avoid it for as long as possible. But then we were in some kind of meeting where uh, the chief engineering officer of the company was describing some problem that they were having. Uh, they wanted to be able to do heterogeneous system development that targeted GPU platforms, but be able to run the same code base efficiently on CPU architectures as well as kind of a fallback or alternative when appropriate GPU systems weren't available. And I said, that sounds pretty much exactly like what my PhD dissertation is about. And so they said, well, we will offer to pay you money to make sure that your dissertation works for this project. And I said, yes. And so that is how, uh, to this day, I still have uh, an affiliation with MultiCoreWare. And uh, I really enjoy working in that environment. There are lots of cool things going on. Today, I'm going to be spending maybe a little bit less time talking about technology details and more time talking about perspective. Because I've noticed a lot from our community in general that I feel like we can sometimes get a narrow mindset of what heterogeneous computing means and what systems development really means. And I'd like to showcase a little bit of what we're doing in terms of compiler technology, a little bit of what I'm doing completely on the side, uh, apart from multi-coreware uh, as well, and try to talk about a different view of how we think of the ecosystems around these heterogeneous and advanced computing platforms that we're looking at. So, next slide. So, went through a quick outline. I've gone through a little bit of uh, my background, we're going to start by looking at a high-performance application study. Uh, we'll look at sort of what does it take to write an application that gets really good performance, that really gets the most out of the hardware systems that we have today. 
And after looking at what it takes to do that kind of optimization, we're going to ask the question, who is going to do this kind of work? Who can do this kind of work? And out of that open question and my response about the state of the art currently, we're going to look at a little bit of the current work that I'm doing at MultiCoreWare to think about how might we develop tools to broaden the ability for more people to take advantage of these kinds of platforms and not just get something running, but get something that runs fairly efficiently. Um, and with that, I'm going to lead into sort of the biggest takeaway point. If you only remember one thing, there will be a slide that I will highlight at some point, which is what does it mean when we talk about efficiency? What does it mean when we talk about you know, getting the most out of our computing resources? And then towards the end, once we've gotten through that perspective, I'll go on a almost completely different uh, presentation. If it looks like I stapled two presentations together, you wouldn't be entirely inaccurate. Uh, but the second part is, again, taking this different perspective of what does it mean to do efficient computing and how can we uh, enable programmers to get more efficient computation. Uh, and efficient both in terms of development effort and in terms of uh, what we actually get of, out of the performance of the system. So, All right, so a little bit of my background. I have been splitting my efforts for years now on two directions. One, I've been building systems and not necessarily doing hardware synthesis myself, but starting from the, my grad school days at the University of Illinois doing compiler technology for new programming languages and new kinds of systems. I had internships at NVIDIA helping their research team and their compiler group do some of the same things. Uh, with MultiCoreWare, I've been doing a lot of the same efforts. And Interestingly enough, at every single one of those places, I've also been asked to do education things. So University of Illinois, that's no surprise. Uh, my advisor, Wen Mei Hu, started the first uh, university class on general purpose GPU programming, and so uh, we got started there. When I was at NVIDIA, I did a decent amount of work going to conferences and doing presentations about teaching new people how to use these new platforms as well. With multi-coreware, both internally and externally, teaching people how do we develop efficient software for the platforms that we have available. And e even at Colgate University now, again, continuing to teach people how do we write efficient software. So with an emphasis on both of those things, uh, just to give you an idea of the background, this is where I'm coming from. I am a systems builder. I care about building hardware and compilers. I think those are fun things. But at the same time, what I want these systems to do is to, I want to be able to present these systems to the people that I'm trying to teach how to use these systems and trying to see where's the mismatch here. What, when I try to teach people how to write efficient software, what is it that they need from the tools that they're not getting in order to be able to do their work efficiently? Okay. So here's my view of what it looks like to write high performance applications today. You really need three areas of knowledge in order to write a high performance application. You first need the application level knowledge. You need to know the task that you're trying to uh, accomplish, which means that you need to be able to look at that task and decompose that task into its building blocks in whatever domain that is. And from there, the information that you're injecting there is the application composition and the application data flow between all of these different blocks. On top of that, you need to know domain knowledge. For each of these individual building blocks, you need to know how to implement them efficiently, you need to know how they work, um, and you need to know how to be able to sort of stitch them together uh, in an efficient way. So you need to know not just, okay, how do I take this application apart, but how do I make sure that the part, individual parts of this application all run efficiently. And lastly, you need to know the target platform. Um, you need to know 
not just what are the efficient algorithms for accomplishing a particular domain objective, but how do you make that algorithm adapted to the features of the hardware platform you're working on? Whether that's VLIW, vectorization, uh, locality management, and whatever flavor that platform supports. Okay. So from there, with this idea, I want to pull over to a quick video. I just saw this a couple days ago. I actually didn't find it myself. Someone else sent it to me. So my guess is that a couple of you might have seen this as well. This is a video presentation of a paper recently from the SIGGRAPH conference, SIGGRAPH 2015, talking about doing some really interesting image processing where they're trying to separate out from a somewhat moving image, separate out reflection from the background. Because often you're in an environment where you're trying to take out this moving foreground that is occluding the background picture that you really want to see, whether that moving foreground is a reflection on glass or whether it's a chain link fence or something, you'd like to be able to sort of separate that out and get a cleaner image of what's behind this obstruction. So first, also full citation, this is the work that I'm citing. Some of you might have seen this already. Um, this is muted because some of you might have seen this. I'll narrate a little bit what they're trying to do technically, but also talk about what does it mean for someone to take a cool idea like this and try to write software that does it? So the objective here is, you know, you see you're trying to take a picture of something outside of the window. But the problem in a windowed environment is that the window isn't fully transparent. There's a reflective component as well. And so when you go through the image, you've got this reflection overlaid on top of the thing that you're trying to see through the window. What you want is the picture of the thing through the window as if the window weren't there, but the window introduces this layer of re reflection. So uh, you can also do similar things with uh, not so much a reflection, but a chain link fence, uh, other kinds of occlusions of what it is that you're really trying to take a picture of. And so what they do is, a little bit on the image processing algorithm, there we go. So. In order to do this motion detection, they say, well, it's hard to independently separate color motion of color pixels. So what they're going to do is first do edge detection because like, the edges of the different components are more clearly discernible than the uh, color values themselves. So the first thing they do is image detection. Then from multiple images and uh, edge detection, they try to figure out how are the edges moving through that image by doing some local uh, optical flow analysis on the edge image. And then based on that, you can sort of sort out, well, some edges are moving in this direction and some edges are moving in that direction. So we can do an optimization problem and separate out which edges are moving in which directions. Uh, from that, you can interpolate because the image, the edges don't fill out the entire frame. You just have these little lines. From there, you interpolate an entire flow field. And from there, you can sort of separate out, OK, what would it mean to sort of reverse that flow or isolate that flow? Can we isolate just the part that is moving in the reflection and just the part that is moving in the background? Uh, it turns out you can do that. And then once you've isolated the flow, you sort of uh, undo that, you remove the part that is moving from the part that you've managed to isolate as being stationary, and you've got a nice separation between foreground and background image. Okay? I think we can go ahead and stop there. Let's head back to the presentation. So this gives you an idea. This is a cool application. Like if I were a smartphone developer, this is the kind of thing that I would want in my built-in camera app that might make my phone stand out a little bit from other people's if it had the built-in capabilities to be able to do something like this efficiently. So how would you do that? Well, remember that we saw there are a variety of steps doing all of these image processing techniques. You start out with an initial image or a couple initial images, and then you do edge detection. And from the input image, you now get an edge image. And then from a couple edge images, you do comparisons and you get a flow image. And 
you do this step a couple more times, there are a few more steps. I don't uh, claim to be an expert on the image processing techniques involved here. But back up. There we go. So how would we make that fast? Well, the main issue is that if we want to write this app efficiently for the hardware we have today, the images that we're working with these days are not small. Uh, we're working with high definition images. They take you know, a couple megabytes worth of space, potentially. And you can't fit that in your level one cache on any platform that I know of. So you can't do this nice modular decomposition. They describe algorithmically what they'd like to do is, first we do image segmentation. Then we do comparison of two edge images. And then we do this next step. And each step is described as a transformation on the entire image. But if you actually wanted to implement this on hardware and make it fast and efficient, you can't do that. You need to manage locality to say, OK, I'm going to take a tile of this image and take this entire sequence of steps and apply it to just that tile. And then move on to the next tile and do that as many steps as I can just on that one tile. And then once you've sort of gotten this collection of operations that you can do on a tile and keeping all that data local, then you start optimizing this collection of functions together as one bulk unit that's applied to this tiled image. Okay. So who can do this? If that's what it takes to write an efficient application to do this image processing thing on the platforms we had today, who can do this? Well, the qualifications are that you need to be able to write code. So we start with a pool of all programmers. That's a pretty big pool. Then we narrow down to the people that can handle this particular application, who know something about image processing. OK, this was a research paper. But now that they've shown everyone how to do this, there are probably a decent number of people that would be able to say, OK, now that you've taught me how to do this, I can write the code that does this. Uh, once you've done this, now you need to start narrowing down to not the people that can write code and know something about images, but also know something about performance optimization. That is a much narrower set of programmers than you might think. At least that's been my experience talking with people uh, across academia and industry. People don't know nearly as much about performance as I think they should, or at least as much as they should in order to write high performance code for today's systems. On the other hand, really, we need a huge number of programmers just to crank out all the functionality that our industry demands. And so if we're putting the burdens that you also need to know performance and you also need to put in a bunch of extra effort to get performance, this is a problem for our industry in general. Even if we could make this section of the pyramid bigger, it doesn't solve our fundamental problem. Uh, then you come down to, I am the person writing the digital signal processor or the image processor, like I'm designing that system and I would like to have this application work well on my digital signal processor or my uh, image processor. Most of the time, the people that know really how to write good code for that kind of processor mostly are in the company that built the processor, mostly. Uh, you can try to get a little bit beyond that, but not too much more. So this is the problem, where we've got this cool application. It's something that we want. It's something that we want to use to sell systems. But the only people, when we look today, that are really capable of delivering this application on our system to the level of performance that would make our system stand out are the same people that are building the systems themselves. That is the fundamental issue that we're running into today, I believe. It's not that we have poor systems. It's not that we have poor software developers. It is that the pool of people that can do this whole thing at once is incredibly small. Okay. So, you look at this and you say, well, how in the world am I going to do this? Like, I can't just, as a silicon vendor, write all of the applications myself. That doesn't work. I don't have enough people. Even if I did have enough people, it would cost too much. No one would give me the money to do this. So 
I would call, uh, what do you, is the next step? I call this the startup model, which is I have a new platform and I'm trying to kickstart an ecosystem that will adopt my platform and s sell that first unit, sell that first system and get it out there, get an application or a couple applications running on it so that it starts selling. Once you've done that, you have to assume, okay, I can't write all the applications myself. So you jumpstart the application development by writing some libraries in-house. And how, to think about this, how many digital signal processing companies do you know that have a port of OpenCV to their platform? Uh, just a thought there. This is better. Uh, this is better than doing it all in-house because you have some level of multiplicative scaling. You put effort into developing these libraries, you release these libraries to application developers and they can use those libraries and get some level of performance. Uh, that's not so bad. But it's also not great either. Uh, for a couple of reasons, some we'll get into uh, for a moment. But another better ecosystem, if you look at the ecosystems that really explode and really support large software developer bases, uh, think about the general Android or iOS app markets. Think about the PC software market. You're really setting up at least a three-tier development system where you enable both app development and library development by third parties. Then some of those third parties write and contribute those libraries and license them to a bigger community. And then the application developers start writing to those library interfaces, again, written by other people who are not you. And this is how you get a much bigger ecosystem set up. Okay? Now this works well, but the issue that we'll see in a moment is that when you build this kind of ecosystem, where does the performance go? Because we started off looking at this application saying, in order to write this application for high performance, you needed to have knowledge that crossed all of those boundaries. The application developer in this ecosystem doesn't have any platform expertise. That's the point of the ecosystem, is to insulate the application developer from the nitty gritty details of your platform. The library developers know the domain, they might know something about your platform, but in order to make their libraries reusable by a community of application developers, you have to impose modularity. You have to write the individual functions separately from each other and encapsulate them because you don't know all of the possible ways that application developers might want to glue those components together. And you as the platform developer are pretty much stuck because if you're trying to develop this ecosystem, you can release compilers and you can release system software, but you as the platform provider are writing that code well before the application developers are writing their code, somewhat before the library developers are writing their code. So you cannot do everything in the compiler and system software. Like you have limitations because you don't know what code is going to be written yet. And that's the big problem that we've run into so far. So next slide. So what do we do about this? Uh, these are, I call these previous approaches uh, mostly because um, I see these proposed in academia a lot as proposed approaches. I have yet to see these really work in practice. Um, the two main previous approaches for us as system developers is you either build the perfect compiler. Uh, you build the compiler that is intelligent enough, can compile the entire library and application, analyze everything, understand your platform, understand everything there is to know about that particular application and the libraries it's using, and do all of the transformations necessary to make your platform efficient. There are lots of problems with this. Uh, it doesn't really scale very well. I have yet to see the perfect compiler. I've written a couple myself. I haven't gotten a perfect one yet. Uh, we will keep trying. In the meantime, uh, the other way you tend to do this is you see something like a compiler in the runtime. Now, this is less prevalent in uh, heterogeneous systems these days, but I'm looking at something like 
uh, JIT compilers for something like Java. Okay? You can do a lot more aggressive optimization by delaying some of your compilation until runtime. Uh, you've got a lot more information available at runtime once you see the whole application running together. You don't have to worry about module boundaries as much to say, I compiled this thing first, I compiled that other thing second, and the compiler that compiled those two different things can't talk to each other. In a JIT compilation environment, you break down some of those boundaries. You've got the entire application right in your lap, and you can start doing more aggressive optimizations. At the same time, this isn't necessarily the most efficient way to go about things for bigger systems in general. I would say it's great for these high productivity languages, but if you want to do a fast image processing algorithm, the more overhead you spend on runtime compilation, the less efficient, the more you have to gain from that optimization in order to make up for it. I think there's more work that could be done here. I think this is a valuable way to go, but I think that we can even do better than this. So the approach that we have, and I'm not going to go too much into the technical detail here, but the overall idea is what I call deferred analysis. And the point is, the problem we've highlighted is there's this separation of knowledge and this separation of information. At the application level, you start having this application data flow. You say, I have this kernel, I have this library function, I'm going to pass it some image input data, then the output of that kernel is going to be fed into the input of another kernel in some kind of sequence, and that's what my application level program looks like. From that, then you've got the code for the kernels themselves, the libraries themselves, which presumably were written at a different time if we're looking at this ecosystem model, were compiled at a different time. If you're looking at a heterogeneous environment, were probably compiled with a different compiler than the original host code was. So from that, what is the information available? Well, the only thing that we can really get from compiling the kernels individually is what the kernels individually do. Now, you can do things like say, well, as an example here, in kernel one, as I'm compiling this, I can say, well, I look at this and say, you know, for a work group, uh, a little bit of an open CL focus here because that's where the product is coming from. But if I have a particular work group, I can actually, in the compiler, analyze a kernel and say, for this particular kernel, it has an output argument. And for that output argument, I can actually say the starting index for a particular work group that it will access is given by this expression. And the size of the data that it accesses is given by this expression uh, for some particular work group index. Then for kernel 2, I can do something similar. And I can say, well, for its input argument, and obviously you would do this analysis not just for one argument each, but for a the set of arguments for each kernel. In the second kernel, you would say, well, for this input, this kernel will access its input with this particular starting index, given its work group ID, and this amount of data. Uh, the, if you're interested, the sizes that I threw in there are for a decoupled Gaussian blur. So the first kernel is doing uh, horizontal, uh, one-dimensional blur, and the second one is doing a vertical one-dimensional blur. And you can write a kernel like that. Uh, it's decoupled. Then the compiler would spit out this kind of information. The problem is, when you compile those kernels, the compiler doesn't know how they're going to be glued together. So you can't really do transformations of the code at that time. You have to be able to defer that transformation until either runtime or uh, at best case scenario, you also provide the compiler that's compiling the host code that also has access to the library information at the same time. I don't think that's super likely, but so I say probably want to do this in runtime. The issue is that if you do this in runtime, all of your transformations are now runtime overhead. And so we've actually had to do a lot of work in this particular product to do as much work as possible on the kernel analysis so that it is a minimal amount of effort in the runtime after that to use those analyses to say, okay, for a particular work group in kernel two, 
what are the work groups in kernel one that provide its input data? Because that's what you need. You need to be able to take your output kernels and kind of do this backwards slice to figure out what is all of the computation that feeds into the inputs of this final output task. If you do your analysis well enough, then your runtime can actually do this backward slice fairly efficiently and then start doing really cool scheduling things. Interestingly enough, this information is exactly the information you also need to do things like automatic DMA promotion, which is another cool feature that we implemented. I, I'm not here to talk so much about the specific cool features that we enable. I want to sort of highlight this as an interesting framework, not because it's just cool technology, it's cool technology, but it is technology that embodies a vision of the ecosystem that is going to be built on top of it. This kind of platform, you can look at it and see it is built from the ground up, assuming that the kernel compiler and the runtime can collaborate asynchronously, but not you can't do everything at once. And you can't make any assumptions when you compile the kernels about how they're going to be glued together until runtime. So this kind of system is built looking at this ecosystem model to say, I know how these tools are going to be used, and I know how people will be able to use these tools to support this two-level layer of someone can write libraries and compile them with my compiler, that's great. Someone can write applications that glues those libraries together, and that's great. And when that application runs on my runtime, I can pull the compiler analysis results that were pre-computed, do a minimal amount of extra work, and do some cool optimizations at runtime. Okay, so next slide. The whole takeaway that I want to put here is the tools that we build, not just the hardware system, but the tools that we build on top of it, will either limit or facilitate the ecosystem that can be built around that system. So let me say that again. If we build tools for the application developer we described at the beginning that knows the whole problem, knows my system, and knows the tools for my system, and does the whole thing himself, if we build tools for that person, and that's what we limit ourselves to, we are precluding ourselves from building this bigger ecosystem around our platform. However, if we build tools that can scale and we have in mind this ecosystem that we want to support from the beginning, we can start rethinking how we build these tools under those constraints that makes it Poss at least possible, technically possible, for this ecosystem to grow and get good performance out of the system we're trying to provide. Okay, So this is one big takeaway that I want to uh, make sure you leave with. So next slide. When we built this thing, we say, hey, you can write in OpenCL that's a whole lot better than your assembly code and intrinsics. So much better so many more people can use your platform. Every time we go to a customer about this, the thing that they always push back with is, but it's not getting our peak performance. It's getting 50%, it's getting 80%, it's getting 75%. It's not getting peak performance, we can do better. You will, if you take this on yourself, you will run into the same issue, and I wanna give you two ideas. One is interoperability. Uh, when you build these tools for the ecosystem, you don't want to preclude the people that know how to do everything from doing everything they know how to do. But there's one other thing that I want to push as more of a perspective idea. Uh, next slide. We tend to look at performance as a one-dimensional trajectory. Just looking at Intel x86 products, you start with 8086, you move forward to Pentium level products, you move forward to core and the modern products. Every time you're doing basically the same thing you were before, but it's just faster, it's better, it's more efficient. Okay? That's one level of viewpoint from a system. You're trying to take whatever you've got, whoever's developing for your platform right now, take them and push their performance ahead as quickly as, and as far as you can. 
That's one view. But I want to say that's a very one-dimensional view of progress in our field. Uh, next slide. A, a more reasonable way of looking at progress is a two-dimensional space of the performance that people are getting and the amount of effort they need to invest in order to get that performance. We started somewhere way off down here at the bottom right corner where we built computers, they were really hard to program, and they weren't very fast. But we didn't just start building faster and faster computers. We also started building better and better compiler tools, better high-level languages, so that we significantly reduced the cost of doing computation. We would not have the software development industry we have today if software developers had to write an assembly code. It just wouldn't have happened. So when people push back and say, we're not getting peak performance, we built this awesome system and we're not getting as much performance as we could have, they have a mindset of being at this top right corner. They're saying performance is the utmost goal and we are assuming that our customers will do whatever it takes to get that level of performance because that's what our system is about. And I think that's a little bit narrow-minded, if you look back as a software developer, you're not necessarily looking to get peak performance all the time. Uh, you normally have two issues. You either have, for a particular application, some minimum performance requirement. What does it take for this to be interactive? What does it take for this to be semi-real-time? What does it take for the latency of these operations to not be a burden on the users of my system? Okay. Once you've established what that minimum performance requirement is, most software developers will just say, I just need to be above this bar. And what I want is the minimal effort it takes to get above that bar. And so you say, okay, wherever that performance is, you draw that line and you want to say, I want to push this curve out and to the left as far as possible so that wherever that performance line is, we save them as much effort as we can. Uh, another way of looking at it is sometimes you know, you're a system provider and you've just got deadlines. You want your platform to be as fast and efficient as possible. And so you're just going to sync optimization effort into it over time. And so you say, well, for a given development effort, how much performance can I get? So you start drawing vertical lines on this graph and saying, okay, for a certain amount of development effort, how much performance can I get? This is a more interesting graph because I would say the issue that we've had recently with heterogeneous and high-performance systems is we've mostly been operating in this top right corner, which is great. This corner will never go away. There will always be the need and the people to drive systems to their utmost in performance. But the volume of programmers out there are operating much closer to the left side of this graph over here. And so the question is not so much how just how far up can we push this graph. I would say the work that we've done so far, e even the work we've done uh, with uh, compiler technology for OpenCL, we're still like taking something that's up at the top left and moving it slightly to the left and a little bit worse in performance. As long as you're staying on this Pareto optimal curve, you've got viable product. You can compete along this curve. If you can push beyond this curve in any direction, you've got an advantage. So if you can take performance and make it easier, you've got an advantage. If you can take a certain level of development effort and make it faster, you've got an advantage. And that's the perspective that I want to say, think about this as you're building your tools and building your platforms. It's not just assuming you're at a certain point and I need to increase performance. Think about where you're positioning yourself on this curve and where can you push it. The other thing is that the, the wider of a sweep along this arc you can feasibly support, the better your system will do. If you can't support the top right, you're going to lose out on some people. You're going to lose out on some customers. That's just the way it is. If you only care about the Python programmers of the world, you're not going to get a lot of uh, you're not going to get a lot of smartphone sales investment if all you care about are people that write in Python. So, but almost anywhere in between there, 
there are software developers at every point along this curve. And if your platform can support as many of them as possible, that is the size of the ecosystem that you can possibly grow. And that's what we tried to do with our MXPA product and these compiler analyses. Like, we're trying to push it down a little bit. Yes, we give up a little bit of performance compared to what the expert could do by themselves. But we're trying to expand how much of this curve a particular platform can cover. So with that, I'm going to transition and talk about a completely other project, uh, which is you know, an example of one of those things where, let's try looking over here. Uh, just as an example, this is very early research. I've got preliminary results, but nothing built that I would be willing to tell you to manufacture in a chip just yet. But this is an example of, well, what if we took a point somewhere further on the left and tried to say, well, I'm not going to try to push you all the way up here. I'm just going to take where you are right now, the development effort you're willing to put in, and make it a little bit faster compared to what it was before. So next slide. Object-oriented code acceleration. This is my current uh, pet interest, and I would love to talk with more of you about uh, this if you have ideas or interests here. Uh, the basic idea is a lot of people are not writing C code anymore. At minimum, they're writing C++, and the number of Java developers is huge. The number of Python developers is growing quickly. And the number of developers that are growing in these areas are people that have never really been able to use computation resources effectively before. That is interesting to me. I would like to enable people that wouldn't be effective software developers 10 years ago and see them be effective software developers 10 years from now. But there are issues. These object-oriented language features don't come for free, at least not a lot of the time. Uh, just one example here is, what about virtual functions? The idea of polymorphism. I can write a generic algorithm that will do something cool like sort a variety of different kinds of data, and it's only at runtime once I'm given data that I know how, this, how to do comparisons. Or it's only once I'm given data at runtime, I know where the location of a particular function is. So what you do is, well, you know, for direct static calls, you just say, well, it's built into the language. The compiler gave me a label. The compiler gave me an address. I just jumped to that address. I know exactly where it is. Virtual functions, it, this is a C++ example. There are different ways of organizing it, but you have at least a two, maybe three, maybe one, if you don't care about memory uh, space that much. A couple levels of indirection. Given an object, find the location of the function that implements this particular method. Okay, That's extra work. That's overhead. From a performance-minded person's point of view, this is something to be avoided at all costs. To a typical application programmer's point of view, this is a way of significantly reducing the amount of software I have to write to get a nice generic library that can be used a lot of different places. So, given that, how would we make this faster? Uh, you can build a faster processor. Just take the generic processor that you've built and go up one more step. Just make everything faster. And the idea there is that, well, as long as CPU speed is growing faster than the amount of overhead my developers are using, we're still winning, right? Uh Sort of. I would argue that we're actually getting less efficient over time if we keep going with this approach. Uh, you can do runtime dynamic translation. We talked about this a little bit already. Uh, and the mindset here is why spend time calling functions when you can spend that time recompiling your functions instead and verifying speculated data types. Um, it turns out, you know, it's a bit tongue in cheek. This works fairly well. Like, this is how all Java virtual machines work these days. This is how most dynamic language interpreters are built these days, including JavaScript and all those sorts of things. Uh, it works fairly well. But you can see in this bullet that there are overheads associated with this, and it's not a universal win. Uh, some of the best uh, results that I heard was at one time, depending on the JavaScript benchmark you used, sometimes 
the fastest interpreter would always beat out the fastest JIT-based recompilation environment just because it was a short enough running program that the overhead of recompilation was just too high. Um, the other thing you can do is just tell people you're doing it wrong and say, real programmers don't write code like this. Real programmers write statically typed languages that the compiler can just solve all of your problems for you. Um, uh, again, this is the mindset that says only a certain area of this performance effort curve is really where I'm focusing. You can focus on any area you want, but I think it's not so correct to just tell people that people who are happen to be in a different area of that curve are just doing it wrong. They're different. They're doing it differently. And they have different needs and different goals. So. What could you do with that? Next slide. So one thing that I am interested in is, OK, let's look at virtual function lookup. If this is something that shows up really frequently in these object-oriented languages, what could we build in hardware that's not a Java processor? I don't think that was a great idea. Uh, but what, what could we build in hardware to make these kinds of high-level language features faster than they are today more efficiently than just cranking up the clock speed of the whole CPU a little bit. Well, if you look at what it's actually doing, you're doing a translation from a virtual function table, which you presumably have the address of somehow, and a function index to find a function address. These tables get referenced a lot, but they don't change very much. Uh, even in the most dynamic languages, you can imagine a lot of experiments have been done to say, you know, 99% of JavaScript code is basically statically typed. Uh, you just don't know it until runtime, basically. All of this together, it sounds a lot like paging. Uh, you know, paging, we've got our page tables. They are translations from virtual addresses to physical addresses. Those tables do change sometimes, but not very much. And they're accessed a whole lot. So if we wanted to take a lesson from the book of paging, what would we do? Well, we'd say, uh, let's look at an example of a virtual function call in x86. We have a special cache called the TLB to cache these paging level translations. And if you wanted to implement a virtual function call in x86, uh, the first thing you would do is use a move instruction to load the virtual function table pointer, and then you'd use a call instruction, which in most modern processors de gets decomposed into several different micro ops to load the pointer of the function you're jumping to, push a parameter to the stack, and then actually execute the jump. Just in these two instructions, if you, uh, if you take them at face value, you're touching the memory system three times. That is a lot. Even if all of this is cached, most CPU architectures aren't built for a 75% memory to uh, generic computation instruction ratio. Uh, you could change your CPU so that you over-provision the memory system, but I don't think that's the route we really want to go. A better way to think about this is to say, what we're trying to get rid of is that extra load of the virtual function pointer. If we introduce something like a virtual function cache, then we, if these virtual functions are being called fairly frequently, we can use it as the effective, uh, effectively like a TLB, where instead of going to the memory system to tell us how to do this translation, we can look up the cache value, and that alleviates at least one of the accesses to the L1 memory system. Once you've done that, then you start having to figure out, OK, for my particular architecture, for my particular instruction set, where does that virtual function access go? Uh, the proposal that I had initially was fuse it with the push operation in x86. But if your instruction set doesn't use uh, the stack directly for the return address, you might want to put it somewhere else. You've got a couple different operations that you might imagine fusing this access into, and that would require an instruction set change as opposed to just a micro-op change in this example. But the whole point is, you know, we've cut out a third of our memory system uh, tax here to do this virtual function lookup, which is a fairly big deal, as you can see from the results next. I think that, yeah. 
So the initial results here just hack this together in the sniper simulator on x86. And you know, doing two comparisons, this is C++, basically the same benchmark, except in one, the function calls were all calling static methods. In another one, the function calls were calling virtual functions that had to be looked up at runtime. Uh, you can tell the difference between the two. You know, it's less than 10% of a difference in instructions. It's a lot more than 10% in terms of time. Because the thing that is being taxed on these virtual function lookups is primarily the memory system, uh, which is already one of, the bottle, one of the major bottlenecks of our systems right now. So with this virtual function cache added, turns out you know, we shaved off about half of that, which is sort of what you expect. In C++, you can see that the virtual function basically adds two extra loads, and the virtual function cache shaved off one of those in this example. And so you see it basically splits the difference between those. So it basically looks like it did what we accomplished. What do you say about this next? Well, again, it all depends on your perspective. If you want to compare this, for instance, with a TLB, which we all know is pretty much a ubiquitous CPU feature these days, it is pure overhead if it's not needed. If you're doing embedded system development and you are entirely dedicated to a particular application and you know that it works perfectly, a TLB in these virtual memory features are just overhead. Similarly, if you're not doing object-oriented programming, if you're not using these virtual functions, this hardware is pure overhead. Uh, it is making your hardware less efficient for the most performance-minded people targeting your platform. It also doesn't encourage efficient software development. It almost rewards people for being lazy and lets them get away with using more work, doing more work than they would really need to if they just knew how to use static functions correctly. But the other thing that it does is it enables system models that wouldn't otherwise be feasible. Facebook, rather famously, invested a huge amount of money to try and mostly compile PHP code statically. It was a huge investment. And the reason that it was so difficult is because the hardware that we built just doesn't support it very well. But this is one step towards, well, what would it take? Uh, if all of this interpreter overhead is a big problem, I don't think we want to go all the way to just build a job of a virtual machine and hardware. But from where we are now, what would it take? I think this is one key piece that we would need to add. But what more would it take to add to architecture that would enable static compilation of Python, static compilation of PHP. How many servers would Facebook buy from you if you could do that? I don't know the answer to that, by the way. But it's an interesting question. So that is pretty much the conclusion of my talk. The takeaways that I would like you to leave with this are do not use the extremes to shoot down proposals all the time, or at least understand when you're doing it. Getting the best per possible performance out of your platform is not the only criteria. Performance is one criteria, but it's not the only criteria that will drive the adoption of your system. Think about this whole performance effort curve. If you can push that curve upward and towards the left, you're doing great. If you can support a wide section of that curve and support developers all the way from the most performance-minded people you can find, all the way to people that are just trying to get reasonably good applications out as quickly as they can, you will have a much bigger market for your platform, whatever it is. There's a lot of opportunity, I think, at both ends. Um, a lot of this middle section of the curve is where we've spent most of our compiler and tools support so far. We've spent most of it saying, take vanilla C code, vanilla C++ code, and do as much compiler optimization work out of it as you possibly can. But I think there's more effort. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to take the edges and push them more towards the middle. So taking the highest performance code that you can imagine and try to figure out how easy can I make it to write that level of performance code. Or from the other way, take the easiest code that you can imagine to write, and how fast can you make that go? Okay. Final point, 
I am a systems builder. I like systems. I like building compilers. But hardware serves software. Applications drive systems. And at least if you want software customers, uh, if you only care about selling to other hardware developers and you only care about narrow application markets, fine, whatever. But if you want to present a system or a platform that really goes after software developers, you need to be really mindful of how those software developers are going to be supported by both your architecture and your tools. And that is all I have for today. I'll have any questions and stick around for a few minutes. Uh, I had a question and maybe a, a mm -hmm. comment as well. The, the, the the question I had was in, in the middle part where you're talking about you know, the abstraction of this uh, meta information for each of those kernels so mm -hmm. that you can do the transformations. Right. Uh, I, I guess my s suspicion is that that's somewhat of an ad hoc set of abstractions rather than aesthetically sort of theoretically complete uh, thing. Or is that incorrect? Um, so if you mean, could those analysis results uh, be too vague, we can't tell? Yes, that is possible in our system right now. Uh, a possible analysis result is that th this kernel doesn't make sense. We can't generate really precise static bounds on this consistently. Right. Uh, so, so I guess that, that's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that, I guess that's one way of putting uh, mm -hmm. what I thought might happen, right. right? Because basically, I guess to put it differently, for getting any specific kinds of application-specific optimizations, mm -hmm. you know, it might work in uh, one particular application or scenario, mm -hmm. but it, it you might need something completely different in a different uh, use case. And uh, mm -hmm. of course, you can generalize it to some extent, but you're right. It, it's not a complete sort of thing, right? So, I mean, fundamentally. Uh, most of the interesting problems in code analysis are fundamentally undecidable problems. So, and this is yes. one of them. Like, it's one of those where fundamentally it is an undecidable problem. Like, theorists have proven that you cannot write a static tool that can generate this information consistently. So the question isn't, uh, is it theoretically solid? No, it's not. It is fairly ad hoc. So the interesting thing is, okay, can we build something that is useful in as many cases as we can get? Right. So, so, so now I'll sort of drop mm -hmm. that bit and sort of I had a, either an observation or a, a further question. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in full disclosure, I used to do this kind of stuff you know, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And the, the problems in the state in the abstract have not really changed, right? Because you're, you're mm -hmm. saying basically the same things that I might have said like 20 years ago, mm -hmm. right? And this is despite a lot of DARPA efforts and you know, UIUC efforts that mm -hmm. I'm sure that you were involved in and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and, and I guess the, the moral from my experience in the early days is that it's kind of a tough battle to actually sell piece parts to, to the guys who want to program. Mm -hmm. And the only way it sort of makes economic sense in the Silicon Valley kind of context is if you provide complete solutions, right? So mm -hmm. you see, sort of optimize stuff, however, mm -hmm. for the end use. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, uh, as a compiler or a systems <laughs> person, the battle continues. So, yeah. so that's what I'm... No, and I agree. I don't think that any of these problems are necessarily new. I do think that some of it is renewed because of the systems that we have. Um, sort of the title of the talk was emphasizing heterogeneous computing. That's a fairly new thing. And so we're seeing the same problems, you're right. Well, I, I, but I would they're disagree sort of because, reapplied. <laughs> because the sort of heterogeneity I was, I was dealing with, mm -hmm. and I used to both, both build chips and microarchitectures as right. well as systems, were also heterogeneous and they had roughly the same sets of things that we have now. Mm -hmm. right? So I, I don't think that has changed. So I would disagree with that yeah. <laughs> assertion there. Yeah, I can but. see that. It depends on your perspective because some people would say that, you know, if you go back far enough, integer and floating point units were considered heterogeneous components because they were like separate IP blocks. And no one thinks that way anymore. Um, so 
that said, there are things that you talk about where, yeah, we've got accelerators, we've got these special purpose processors that, especially in the embedded market, have been around forever. And I think what we're seeing now is less... Uh, I think what we're seeing now is that until recently, we haven't seen the vast demand for as many software developers as want to target these embedded kind of platforms as until we've seen recently. I think there are more people interested in the embedded realm now because of the smartphone than have ever really existed before. Uh, so interesting segue on what you were just talking about, about different types of processing units. Mm -hmm. um, so let me take you back to your days at NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. Let's chat about things like NVLink, mm -hmm. Taurus Networks. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about the problems that we face collectively as a community, that the hardware, going back to heterogeneity, mm -hmm. the hardware that you're deploying on, whether it be CPU or GPU, mm -hmm. um, or some other type of core, right. that based on what the hardware is, will make extreme differences in what you're proposing. And let me give you just a simple example. Mm -hmm. So the Tesla card, right. show me someone that's gotten above 3,000 cores lit up. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you, you've got someone who spent way too much time trying to do one <laughs> little thing. Yes. But there's 5,000 cores, 4,996, right? Right. You go to the Titan X. Well, we're lighting up 80% of those cores. Mm -hmm. So, but we're building heterogeneous envi environments now that have mm -hmm. Tesla and Titan X. Yep. And just to throw one last layer into it, as we move into this image processing world, mm -hmm. this is a separate question. Right. What are your thoughts about single precision versus double precision needs? Okay. Uh, so let's go with the first question first is, you know, looking at heterogeneous systems where you see we've got big beefy GPUs these days in HPC and like even the people using it today can't really get all of those lit up today and we're going to even supercomputing level systems where we've got lots of those platforms already. Um, yeah, that's tricky. Uh, there, are two, there are two main issues going on there. One is I don't, e even the Tesla cards that we have today, a big part of the reason that we can't get all the units lit up is because of memory constraints. Um, in order to feed that much compute power, you need a lot of memory coupled beside of it. Yeah, exactly. So in terms of that, I, I don't have a great solution for that problem yet. I think it's a fundamental problem. It's not the one that I'm focusing on right now, but yeah, that's the real issue there. Now in terms of, uh, there's one other thing that I do want to comment on that's sort of related in that area is, you know, looking at not just scale, but GPUs with thousands of cores versus CPUs with dozens of cores, but yet having similar computation power. What does that mean? There is a fundamental problem here where what we talk about as a thread or as a task is fundamentally different for a variety of different platforms. And I didn't talk about that too much in my presentation here, but all of this sort of analysis and fusion stuff is built on top of a core technology that we had, which is all about Parallelism granularity adjustment. And that, I think, is a big problem we're making some progress on, but that is the number one problem that we really need to get a handle on is how do we allow programmers to express parallelism in a way that can be efficient at a variety of different parallelism granularities? That's a hard problem. We're making some progress, but that's, I think, a very fundamental problem that we need to keep working on. Uh, regarding single versus double precision, um, I don't know. I, I haven't talked enough with image processing people to be told which one is necessary or more important. I think, again, it's one of those issues where if you don't know, you tend to err on the side of caution and say just use double precision because we need it. Why do you need it? We need it. Um, or you go and say, you talk to people that 
really know what they're doing, again, smaller group of people, and they'll be able to say, we need double precision in these places for these reasons, we don't need double precision in these places uh, for these other reasons, and can sort of take advantage of both. Uh, I think that's an area where we need to think about this, because the majority of developers don't know whether they need double precision or not, and since they don't know, we'll assume they need double precision whether they do or not. Um, we need to ha figure something out there because if they're going to assume that they need it whether they do or not, if we want to develop a system that runs efficiently, uh, given those assumptions, we need to figure out what we're going to do about this. So I don't have any specific ideas there, but yeah, that, that's, that is another big issue. Thank you very much to John. <laughs> Thank you.